For those who are able, please stand for the call to worship. Come, join the journey. Come, walk and sing. Be changed and be renewed. Make a procession of joy before God, before Jesus Christ, the renewer of the world. All things are made new in Christ. The fullness of life in Christ is found in forgiving others, finding healing and reconciliation, and working for justice, knowing that sin and death do not have the final word. The opportunity for new life is now. Embrace the fullness of life in Christ, knowing you are forgiven, restored, and loved. Amen.
would like uh, the congregation to help them sing the third verse. It's in the uh, songbook, number 73. We're going to be singing that verse. We're going to be singing it the first time, then we have a second verse, and then we'll be singing it the third time. And uh, the congregation join in. Okay? Hey, boys and girls, what superhero did you learn about this time? Who was your superhero? It's the big guy. Jesus. Jesus was your superhero. So what was your rotation about this time? The Last Supper, that's right. Does anybody recall what happened at the Last Supper? You forget, uh-huh. Anybody remember what happened at the Last Supper? Why was it called the Last Supper? Nora? It was the Last Supper before Jesus died, that's right. Jesus had been with his disciples for three years and they had been teaching and going around talking about ministry and they served all different kinds of people. And he was also teaching them how to serve all different kinds of people and a lot of other stuff. So. I'm going to back up a little bit. Does anybody know what today is? I know some of you had some things waving in the air. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Does anybody remember what happened on Palm Sunday? Hi, Ellie. Jesus rode the donkey in Jerusalem, right? So we'll go back a little bit. That happened before the Last Supper. So Palm Sunday is a special day. This is the day when Jesus told his disciples to borrow a donkey and Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was the beginning of what we call Holy Week. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Were the people happy or sad to see Jesus? Happy. They were happy to see him. And Jesus was happy to see everybody else. And they were waving, what were they waving? Palms and coats, right? That's right. So later on in the week, Jesus gathered his disciples and held a special Passover meal which is called the Last Supper. Um, Jesus loved his disciples so much and they loved him that he was preparing them for what was to come. So what happened a few days after the Last Supper? Nora? Jesus got betrayed and Jesus died. And it, Jesus came back alive on what do we call that day? Easter, that's right. So a lot happened in, in a short week, didn't it? People were happy to see Jesus, and then he had a last supper with his friends, and then he died, and then he rose again. That's a lot in a week, isn't it? <clears throat> it's magical. Caleb said it's magical. It is magical. That's exactly right. It's magical. So 
Sometimes Jesus served people and they were nice people, or sometimes he served people that weren't nice people, but Jesus serves everybody. So sometimes we need to do difficult things like showing love to people who are not nice to us, but Jesus' example for us is that we serve all people, and that's the lesson of the whole week, and that's the lesson of Jesus. So let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, we are ready to serve. We are ready to love. Give us eyes to see, hands to help, hearts to care. Thank you for being so good to us. Give us grace to care for all your people. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture this morning, we are reading from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteousness, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever.
Our gospel lesson this morning is found in the gospel according to Mark in the 11th chapter and beginning with the first verse. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt who has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. Well, they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying this colt? And they told them that Jesus had said, and what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead, of, went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Well, a psychology instructor had just finished a lecture on mental health and had proceeded to give an oral quiz to the freshman class. Speaking specifically about manic depression, the instructor asked, how would you diagnose a patient who walks back and forth screaming at the top of his lungs one minute, then sits in a chair weeping uncontrollably the next? Well, a young man in the rear of the room raised his hand and answered, a college basketball fan? Well, it's really interesting this year to have March Madness and Holy Week coincide this year in the very same week. And quite frankly, many probably hold the NCAA tournament in higher regard than, say, Monday, Thursday or Good Friday. It's also probably true that words like Sweet 16 and Final Four and National Champion will be on the lips of far more people in the United States and will be far more a part of our consciousness than words like Hosanna, tomb, or even resurrection. In fact, when was the last time you said the word Hosanna before today? As one commentator I read surmised, it was probably a year ago on Palm Sunday. Well, today, as we learned in the children's lesson, is Palm Sunday, the day that begins Holy Week, which also includes all the events of what we call the Passion of Jesus, Jesus' betrayal and arrest and crucifixion and burial. It is a week that leads up to the pinnacle of the Christian year, the day of Easter. It is the last week of the season of Lent. It is for Christians to be one of the most intensely spiritual times in the Christian calendar, a time when we remember the stories of Jesus, especially in this last week of his life, when we reflect on our faith in light of all that is happening in the Scripture, in which we deepen our Christian practice through prayer and worship together and service. It's a time in which we prepare even more intensely as we begin to move towards that celebration of Jesus' resurrection. But as we gather here today, how much is Palm Sunday really on your mind? As you brought the palm in today in your hand, what did you think as you were carrying it, as you put it in front of you and the chair holder and the uh, holder for the books? What's the point of remembering such a day that happened so long ago in Jesus' life? It's just a story that happened thousands of years ago. What does it have to do with? with us today. Well, one of the interesting things about the Gospel of Mark is just how stark and lean it is, how easy it is, I think, to get into the story. 
Not a lot of explanation or theologizing about any of the events that are happening. Not as much detail as you might find in the other Gospels. It's much more down to earth. And the story of Palm Sunday in the Gospel according to Mark is even a bit more toned down than in the other Gospels. We might assume that on that day there were huge crowds, a huge parade that day as Jesus made his way on that colt or on that donkey and to Jerusalem. But if you read Mark, you don't really get that feeling. You kind of feel like maybe there were not so many people there, just a few, a, a crowd, maybe not thousands, maybe just hundreds, maybe even 50. And it becomes even more almost mundane as we read the end of the story about Palm Sunday in Mark's Gospel, and it is so much more subdued. Do you remember how the story ended about that first Palm Sunday day? Then he, Jesus, entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. And so he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So in this story, Jesus meanders over to the temple, takes a look around, and seeing that it's already late and nothing's really going on, he then goes with his disciples to Bethany. Kind of not really a big climax to the story, right? Well, Susan Andrews puts it, unlike in Luke and Matthew, in which Jesus storms into the temple on that Palm Sunday and hastens his death through anger and confrontation, here he wanders quietly into the temple and looks around just simply looks around. He does a reality check and then slips away to Bethany. He withdraws to a place away from pressure and danger and decision, a place away from the inevitability of pain and suffering and death. A pause in the action, a reality check. You know, I've never thought of Palm Sunday in those terms before. I've always thought of Palm Sunday more like March Madness. Excitement, shouting, going crazy, seeing who will be crowned the new king. Mark's version takes a different turn. With Jesus moving into Jerusalem almost unknown, and then quietly checking out the temple, getting his bearings, and then slipping away quietly to Bethany. Soon the madness will begin. Soon Jesus will be swept up into the events of his passion, giving his life and sacrifice in obedience to God's purpose, in obedience to God's ark of salvation. But on this day, on this Palm Sunday, according to the gospel given to us by Mark, it's a reality check. Maybe we need a reality check this day, too. Some days it feels like our life gets caught up in way too many things. Many of those things are out of our control. Sometimes we get up, get caught up in things that are fun, but really don't matter in the wide scope of life events. I know, at least for me, I'm getting way too caught up in the brackets. I'm getting way too caught up in other sports scores and other national uh, tournaments that are happening in different sports. I mean, after all, look. I mean, the brackets, Duke has won five national titles in the last 20 years or so. I love Duke basketball. They're perennial participants in the NCAA tournament. But I have to ask myself, how does Duke basketball or the NCAA tournament actually meet the deep spiritual needs of the world, or my own deep spiritual needs. Yes, it's a lot of fun. Yes, it's intriguing. Yes, I love it when Duke wins. Yes, there are sports teams that speak of their faith and go out and serve like the Philadelphia Eagles. But what is it, and who is it, that meets my most and your most pressing need for grace? and salvation, and purpose. What about all the things we get wrapped up in that truly are not important? What is it that takes us away from really being able to think about, to accept, to receive, to offer that grace that has been given to us? So we pause today for a reality check.
Well, there's a story told by the Reverend Dr. Scott Johnson. He's a pastor at Fifth Presbyterian Church in New York City that I think can help us out with thinking about this reality check, especially as we think about our faith this day and how Palm Sunday might possibly be connected to our daily lives and to our purpose and to our deepest spiritual needs. It's a story related to a single word in our gospel lesson today, and that word is Hosanna. You know that word we just say once a year? Scholars believe that Hosanna is a contraction of two Hebrew terms, yasha, meaning to save or deliver, and na, meaning to beseech or pray. So you could translate the shouts of the crowds that day as we beseech you to deliver us, or simply save us. So now the story. Pastor Johnson said that he met with a group of seventh graders in his church to answer some questions that they had scribbled on three-by-five cards that they wanted to pose to their pastors. Four of the twelve cards asked, Is Jesus the only way to salvation? Well, being an annoying pastor, he said, he told them that before he would answer that question, they had to answer one for him. And he asked, since salvation implies that you are being saved from something, what do you think that Jesus is saving you from? Well, the first answer that came back was hell. Jesus saves people from hell. Now, Pastor Johnston didn't think that was a bad answer at all. However, he goes on, I must admit that my initial reaction when someone answers that hell is what God saves us from is suspicion. I am suspicious when I hear that answer. First, because for a good portion of American Christians, this is the only and obvious right answer. In other words, I had to wonder if the youth were thinking, here is the preacher, the question is, what does Jesus save us from? And he must want us to answer in this particular way, hell. It's kind of similar to what happens when I go to see the doctor and he asks, so how have you been exercising? And I know what he wants me to say. Still, beyond being suspicious of people's tendency to want to tell the pastor what they think he or she wants to hear, he said he had some theological concerns about this answer. It's a complicated thing, he says, to ask, what does God save us from? I am certain that the biblical witness supports me in this, he says. Take, for example, our Palm Sunday text. I don't believe that the people lining the streets in Jerusalem that day were primarily concerned about hell when they were shouting Hosanna to Jesus. The Gospels hint that the crowd's motivation was that they wanted to be saved from the Romans. They wanted deliverance from an occupying army. They wanted deliverance from oppression. And all of this was to say that I decided to change tactics with the seventh graders that day. Let me put it this way, he said to them. If God was on the ball, if God really cared, what would God save you from? And suddenly, he said, their conversation got very interesting. One of the youth raised her hand and said, I want God to save me from death. Another fellow offered that God could really help him out by saving him from an upcoming math test. Then one of the seventh graders said, pressure. And yet another you said, my parents' expectations. Then another shy individual, almost in a whisper, said, I want God to save me from fear. I want God to save me from my fears. All of these, he said, struck me as far more sincere than hell, although I think you could argue that their comments gave a pretty clear picture of what hell looks like to a seventh grader. So what about us today? Can we dip down into our souls and be as honest as these young people were that day? When we wave our palms or when we hold them or when we see them in front of us or when we boldly cry out, Hosanna, do we dare imagine what we really want God to save us from? Save me, God, from anger, 
Save my aunt from cancer. Save my son from depression or my mother from dementia. Save me from my overwhelming bills. Save me from the strife in my family. Save me from boredom or my inadequacy. Save me from getting sent back to the Middle East to fight once again. Save me and our world from the endless cycle of violence. Do you think it was coincidental that the marches yesterday happened right around Palm Sunday? Maybe it was just a coincidence, but I think it was God's Spirit working. Because it was in those marches that we were hearing the pleas and the cries of young people saying, please save us. I was listening to an interview on the way in to church this morning. And they were talking to one of the young people who had been at the march, I believe, in Washington, D.C., and as the interview was going on, she broke down. And the interviewer asked her, why are you crying? And she said, I am so tired. I am so tired of people dying. Save us. Save me from my guilt. Save me from the ways in which I avoid the problems of the world, or when I see the world in such simple ways that I try to give simple answers to complex questions. Save me from my arrogance. Save me from my bitterness. Save me from my loneliness. Save me, God. Save me from my fears. When we take a pause today, a reality check, we can begin to see Palm Sunday in a way that turns us from seeing it as just another remembrance of some celebration long ago to a day that has some spiritual depth for us today. As if those people crying Hosanna thousands of years ago, that those voices echo in our hearts and souls this day to save us. A cry to God to save us from those most difficult moments, to save us from those things that we struggle with. Asking God to come into those most vulnerable places inside us to speak to us, to teach us, to save us. Hosanna. We ask God this day to come into our lives and to the lives of so many around us, so many in the world, so many broken places. We ask God to come to save us, to heal us, to build us up, to create us, to cleanse us, to save us, to give us a right spirit and a right heart and a right mind, to give us the courage and the strength to go out and do what God has called us to do, to save us not just so that we will receive wholeness and grace, but that the world might indeed be saved, just as God love intends. Save us, O oh God, that we might be able to face the days with purpose and justice and grace and in service. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us. Amen.